Let's jump in. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say before we start is, uh, first, Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know Allison will give you an introduction, but it's great to have you. And I'm certainly looking forward to uh, your online workshop, Getting Your Middle Grade or uh, Young Adult Novel Unstuck. And that's Me too. Online. So, welcome, Allison. Sure. So. Good morning. I'd like to say welcome to Highlights Foundation Gather. We're grateful to have Sarah Aronson and Chris Tebbets with us this morning. Uh, we'll have time to listen to Chris and Sarah in conversation. Then you can ask questions of these two amazing writers using that Q&A feature. We'll get to just as many as we possibly can. If uh, you've joined us each week, you know that Sarah Aronson writes everything from picture books to novels. She is a gifted teacher and an enthusiastic supporter of storytellers. Sarah is our hostess with the most each week at Wednesday's Gather, as well as faculty to many of our courses here at the Highlights Foundation. And we thank her today and always for her support. Chris Tebbets is the New York Times bestselling author of Books for Children and Teens. He's co-written projects with James Patterson and Jeff Probst. And his most recent standalone title, Me, Myself, and Him, is an alternate timeline choice shifting matrix style book where readers get to consider what happens in life during plan A and a plan B. Um, I'll be posting some links to both Chris and Sarah's books in the chat um, via the shopping platform bookshop.org, uh, which can help support your local bookstores as well. And um, we're going to take some time now just to really sit back and enjoy this conversation between Sarah and Chris. Keep the chat going if you'd like, but remember if you have questions to pop them into that Q&A field and we will get to them just as soon as we can um, after the conversation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chris. Let's get started. Excellent, all right. Well, um, as thank you, Allison. Thank you, George. This is the highlight, um, pun intended, of my week. Um, this chat, HF Gather, is all about um, my three C's, creativity, curiosity, and community, the foundation of everything we do, and what has clearly become so important during this time. But it's also about the eyes, inspiration, intuition, intellect, and idea. Um, I think today we're going to talk a lot about inspiration. Um, just a just a thought. Um, so well, let's start by showing you the um, word of the day. Chris, you have to close your eyes. All right, here we go. I know I've been on a roll of not picking a word that anybody says, but okay, it's good. You, mm -hmm. can, you can look again. Yep. Okay. But I think today I will get it right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll never know. <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you later if okay. I have okay. yeah. Anyway, let's start um, the way we always start with, um, with creativity. Um, how has it been going for you? Um, and have, but have you discovered um, an inroad to creativity during this time of solitary, really feels like sometimes solitary confinement um, during this time? And what can you share with us about that? You know, I'm definitely in the lucky category. Like everybody, I, you know, I invented the word fine stressed fine the other day, which is to say I'm fine with a little stress in the middle of that sandwich, but mostly fine. Um, I, I'm not somebody who has kids who are now home. Um, I'm used to working at home. So the routine is relatively familiar. I'm a relatively quiet, indoor, stay at home kind of guy. That's all sort of continued to work for me, you know, even though there, there's this new element of stress amongst it all. I hear from a lot of friends who are having a hard time uh, with their creative work, with their writing, with focusing and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I felt like I felt into a fairly uh, creative space when this all started. I feel a little bit lucky and a little bit unusual that way. And then after a few weeks, I began to realize that um, I think the thing that was really affording me that creativity was that I had two projects with a lot of revision on the table, two, two things mm. where I was doing a lot of heavy revision and almost no first drafting. Um, and I think that has really helped to have something that I can respond to as opposed to something I'm trying to create uh, from, from square one. Um, so I have 
felt creative, I felt productive um, and grateful for that. Um, but I also realized that those, when I get to the end of this revision and those blank pages start staring me in the face, it may be another answer. So I'm not sure. Um, and then also I, I have a few little notes here. Um, I've also think I've really benefited from, as I think a lot of us have from the sort of mental energy that comes from the learning curve of the adaptation that we've all had to put ourselves through. Yeah. Starting up a little YouTube channel, doing online teaching, that sort of thing gives me a learning curve. And I think that's been particularly welcome now and it's required a, you know, a whole new kind of creativity. Yeah, I think that the first time I, I put together a YouTube video, I recorded it 20 times trying to get it right. And now when somebody wants a video from me, I press record, I do it, I send it off. I know I have more confidence in my authenticity and not worrying so much about the things that I had to learn in the beginning to do that part of the job. There's a, um, what is it? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention or what have you. The first video I recorded was a, a good beginnings workshop for kids that they could do at home. And um, I did the same thing. I was like, ah, you know, it's a time of forgiveness. We're just gonna, it's gonna be warts and all and I'll record it once. Um, and then when I watched it back, I realized how many times I touched my face in the course of the video. So when you watch it, anytime a graphic comes up or I cut away to a, you know, text or something on the screen, it's usually me covering up a, a nose itch or something like that. You know, that's a whole new ball game as well. Quick question. So I'm, I'm drafting. So um, I'm not revising right now, although I should be. Um, and um, I'm wondering, are you, as you revise, are you aware of social distancing? Are you adding social distancing to your novel? Or are you assuming a time period without social distancing? I forget who it was. It might have been Joe Knowles who said, who posted on Twitter, am I writing historical fiction by having my characters go to the movies and hug one another? Um, which hadn't even occurred to me. And of course, it, it sort of invaded my brain. I am choosing to write, especially because these are pro projects that I started before all of this began. I'm choosing to write um, the story without letting that influence me. Um, but it's certainly in the back of my head that um, there may be future revisions required or, um, or not. I, I mean, I think we're gonna be talking about this a lot during the hour, but we're living with so much I don't know right now. Um, and on that question, I'm choosing to uh, just full steam ahead with my story as I wanted it. Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot as I draft about how often the gestures that I choose for my characters are involved touching because I'm a hugger in real life. Me so too. my Characters tend to be huggers too, and that that may never be the same again. And I'm wondering what else can I say about my characters? It's actually opened the door to um, to new new activities for interior monologue. Um, oh. You know, while I'm drafting this new book, it's been interesting. So yeah, took away some of my tools. Um, so I think both of us. Uh, have often lectured about um, inspiration and play um, and this idea of feeling playful, which has a, a million different definitions and practical uses. So let's start by um, how did you come to play and what does it mean to your process? Um, you know, I mean, for st the first thing I, I think about, my mother made me a reader. My father made me an eternal child, I would say. Nice combination there. Um, Lovely. Yeah. My father was uh, the most playful person I think I've ever known in, in every respect. Um, so it began with that. Um, I have a theater background and um, I think we're going to talk about this as well. For me, play is inextricably li linked up with the topic of improvisation, um, which is something that al I was always attracted to as a theater artist, as a director. Um, and I've done workshops on how can we use those concepts in our writing as well. Um, and then Actually, I'll stick with the, with the notion of theater. One of the ways I became a better director of plays over time was becoming less product oriented, less worrying about that opening night, or in the case of, you know, to translate for book writing, less worried about the finished draft, and more pro process oriented, more about really finding the story in the moment. Even as somebody who outlines and, you know, sort of knows a lot about my stories ahead, I still, the, the better I get at it, the more room I try to leave for myself um, for spontaneous discovery, which is play, which is really sort of part of play. Uh, Stuart Brown has a TED talk with an, a quote that I pull from him from one of my presentations where he says, if its purpose is more important than the act of doing it, it's probably not play, um, mm -hmm. which I like. So doing Love the that. thing, it's, 
yeah, all about process, less about product. Um, but I would also add, and I, I, I won't go into it now, I can say more about this if you like. Um, I love that free flowing, not attached quality, but I've also really come to see play as a very practical tool for doing my best work, for freeing myself up. Um, so Norma Fox Mazur was the first person who said to me, structure is freedom. And that my first, um, you know, sort of misstep in the writing process was thinking that I couldn't know anything to be creative. Right. And now that like, I've got a whole outline for my new draft that it doesn't mean I stick to it. It doesn't even mean, it doesn't hold me back. It just shows me where I want to imagine and, and dive into that process. And it does it without fear, which of course is to me what play conquers is fear. Yeah, I mean, I joked with you, as you know, on Facebook yesterday, I feel like you and I were made from, at the same writer factory. We, we seem yeah. to come around a lot of the same conclusions. I find it very gratifying, not just with you or with interpersonal relationships, but things that I intuit about the creative process because I think about it a lot. And then I hear echoed elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere. Makes me feel sort of tuned in and connected to other artists and also makes me feel like I'm on the right track. Yeah. Um, and I love what you said about it being, I'm sorry? Ideas fly in the air. And we're, yes. all, you know, we're all thinking and trying to be, you know, trying to find story from the same, sort of the same places, the same, same um, you know, cues in the world. Ethers, yeah. And I love what you said about it being the opposite of fear, because in my mind, this is another topic I think about a lot, creativity and fear. I've been doing some workshops on self-promotion for those of us who suffer from social anxiety and shyness and imposter syndrome. I think about it a lot. And to me, fear is all about uh, living, um, it's all about unknown outcomes, about how we're a, sort of a, make ourselves beholden to our past mistakes and afraid of what might yet happen. And play is the opposite of the, in that context. Play is here, play is now, play is not worrying about the outcome. Yeah. Um, play is also um, more enjoyable than fear. <laughs> and when I'm enjoying yeah. myself, it's a lot better. It feels a lot better and I feel confident. And I, you know, Julie Berry was the first person who um, talked to me about how voice and confidence are inextricably linked. And um, I think that when we feel that confidence, getting stuck happens less. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. I, there's a book called The Art of Character by, I forget who, um, and he talks about developing a, re a strong enough relationship with your story to the point where you develop what he calls coherent intuition. Mm. And you just know what to say. I mean, it, it relates to what people also call flow state, uh, where you're in the activity, you're not thinking about the activity. Um, it's, it's the best feeling in the world, really, as a creative person. Yeah. No, it, it totally is. How do you get in? Do you have, um, have techniques for getting into that flow state? Or... Um, I mean... Yes and no. It, it's, uh, I feel like I spend uh, the bulk of my writing time trying not to try, yeah. trying to get into that space. So, you know, it, it's, you know, they say enlightenment is, oh yeah, not aha. It's, it's about sort of falling back into a familiar place and getting there. Um, and it, it, it's, um, you know, the universe messes with you in that way. They, they, it, it makes it a very, it's a very rarefied space. Um, but, but again, you sort of, you, you can't will your way into, you sort of have to use a, you know, a little bit more grace than that. You have to find your way there. Um, it makes, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy. It makes me think of how, at least I, when I look at the night sky, if I look directly at a star, it disappears. If I look just a little to the side, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, and if I don't drive myself too firmly at what I'm trying to accomplish or hold too firmly to what I'm, you know, what I, what I think my outcomes are gonna be, um, that's one way of me getting into that freer space, letting go of expectation, um, and also just really sticking with it. I know a lot of people uh, talk about go, take a walk, clear your head if it's not working. Um, that's great advice. I tend to be someone who really makes myself stay at the computer. I'm really learning more and more about living with the discomfort of not knowing, um, because I never know when I'm going to fall in. And yeah. so acknowledging that discomfort is just part of the process and not like something's wrong. I cannot agree with you enough that getting comfortable with the muddle, um, especially when you're in the middle and just not, not walking away from it, 
just really dwelling in it and asking yourself those questions. Why am I muddled? What is happening here? What do I know about these characters in this moment that I am feeling that I that I'm not feeling unsure? And generally, if I keep playing and keep either writing from different points of view or you know trying different things, making a bunch of lists yeah. or drawing. Yesterday, I when I got stuck, I had to draw my character. So here she is. <laughs> You're she, a better artist than I am. She makes kugel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but it is, and just drawing, just just that act of drawing while staying at the job. So not taking a walk, um, which often works for me. Also, savasana works for me. Mm. Um, lying down on my mat mm -hmm. and just making myself do nothing because it's hard to do nothing. Yeah. You know, I don't find that to be something I can do for a long time. That in five minutes of savasana, usually I'm, I'm ready to get back to, um, to, the, to the work. That's why Pomodoro works for me. Oh, okay. That, yep. And that makes me think also of why the falling asleep time and shower time for so many people is a very creative space. We're sort of clearing our head, making room for things. Yeah, it's um, like what you said. It's about tricking yourself into writing. So I trick myself into feeling like I know, oh, you know everything. Yeah. And, if, um, and if I'm tricking myself, I feel pretty good about it. If I'm tricking myself, I think that the book is like I, the confidence goes up. And then I take chances that I wouldn't take if I was nervous about that product. Absolutely. It doesn't even feel like a chance when, you know, the stars align. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say something. Oh, uh, that's another bit of my optimism. And I talk about this in some of my workshops, which is, as far as I'm concerned, there is always something I can do in my project. Not working on my project means I don't want to. It doesn't mean I'm truly, truly stuck. It doesn't mean I can't. There's always something I can do. In my early days, I wanted all of my writing time to be drafting time. And now I consider the drawing, you know, I, I same thing like you. I, I make maps of my little kids. I, I, may, um, I do really, really bad storyboards, as you can see. That's a bear. Um, not that you could tell. No, um, you could tell. You know, I scribble. I make... Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I do research on my topic. I read what I've already read. There's always something I can do. And I file all of that under play, which again is it being about my process, not about my product, but just getting to know the story from as many angles as possible, doing anything to support the story that I can. A lot of yeah. people anthropomorphize their, or not anthropomorphize, they have a relationship with their characters that I feel is analogous to the relationship I personally have with my story. I try to you mm -hmm. know, let, it, let it know it's, I'm there. I play with it. I cajole it. I show up regularly, as Mary Oliver tells us to do. Um, that also sounds very Liz Gilbert. My best friend yes. doesn't know me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you and Liz like that. All the time. <laughs> she talks about following your, your curiosity, not your passion, which is another piece of advice that I love. You know, passion is, is, is sort of unattainable. It doesn't always show itself. Curiosity is always right there. And for me, another defining characteristic of play is that is about finding the immediately achievable things, like making that list of what you know about the story, making a list of what you don't know about the story. Right. Again, there's all. I mean, it's also what, what I'm curious about is usually what somebody else is curious about. And that curiosity drives me to the next question that I didn't know I wanted to ask. Uh, that makes me think of what Linda Sue Park talks about working with her editor that, you know, Linda Sue writes A, her editor says, what about B? And it's usually neither of those things. It's usually A plus B leads to C. Right. Well, that, yes. Um, we talked over the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about critiquing. And one of the things that I always tell my, tell the people I'm working with is that the critiquing is not a to-do list. It's not stagnant. It is, it is what you should ask yourself why. Like use that as a prompt to say, why did Sarah just say that? Um, not because Sarah knows everything, but why do I think she said that? And then um, answer it in a new way, not in a way that I thought of. Find a new way that feels um, organic to the story and that you know is true. And that is usually the way that is the right way or that gets the story written or that gets that. one stuck. They say feedback and 
by extension, critique is a gift. And I've always liked that in my own way because you know what what is uh, what that may not seem to imply is when when the gift giver leaves, you get to do whatever you want with the gift. Right. Right. Yeah. I've been ignoring my gift. <laughs> um, as I draft this new secret project, I've been ignoring um, my gift of feedback until you posted your something about your course. And then I started making an, um, a calendar for my book. And, that, yeah. and it really helped me see what was, what I was skipping over, what I was spending too much time on, and where were the places that I could make my strong, story stronger? And it took me 10 minutes. Right? I, well, yeah, the, the whole like, oh gosh, I should have done this sooner thing. I, that's a, maybe a separate subject. Um, I never but, worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> story uh, begets story and writing begets writing. So I wouldn't have gotten to that place had I not written that stinky draft. Well, I guess that's, uh, yeah, you're actually giving my own point back about it's all part of the writing process. Oh, and the calendar thing, all of these things, but I was going to say specifically with storyboarding, um, it really helps me. I'm, I was a film major in college, so I think very visually, as I think a lot of writers do, I think about my stories as movies, but actually storyboarding a scene before I've written it, can, or a, a, as a, after I first drafted it as a means of revising, really shows me um, what I do, and more importantly, what I don't need to show the reader in a way that I can't always find with words on the page. Right. Right. It also lets you stand back and look at your, your, your characters um, from a little bit of a distance that we often don't do, especially when we're writing in yeah. first person. So creating that storyboard allows you to see the other people. I know the first time I did a storyboard, I was surprised to see this one secondary character keep popping up. And I was like, what are you still doing here? <laughs> And then I realized I was missing all this tension because that one character had something to say that I was so focused on my original character that I was just avoiding. I loved learning along the way that those things that I thought were silly cliches are actually so true when our characters speak to us or um, uh, Allison mentioned my YA novel, Me, Myself and Him, which is um, told in two threads, two parallel threads, as I think you know, Sarah, but um, it follows the character through two different outcomes from an inciting incident. And the whole reason is it was supposed to be a traditional novel. I was writing along, I was writing along. My character got in trouble with his parents. He was supposed to get shipped off to California to live with his dad for the summer. And I was, I was on page 75 or something and he would not get on the plane to California for some reason. And that's what led me to go, oh, well maybe I don't have to choose. Maybe I'm gonna write both of those stories. That openness I, was invaluable in that case. Thank My you. openness to it. Yeah, it's, um, that's, a great, that's, that's a great story. And it's a great book. Everyone Thank should you. read it. <laughs> um, and really satisfying at the end. Oh, that's, that's good to know. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Always really good to know. Satisfying. I won't spoil it, but it was really satisfying at the end. I was like, oh, I'm going to think about this for a while, which are my favorite books. My favorite definition of a good ending, just as a tangent, is that it is surprising and inevitable. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and that surprise, some, does that surprise ever surprise you? Um, yes, I mean, those are some of the best writing days. Yeah. Uh, you know, things that, that, my very favorite thing, and I, I suppose this goes a little bit hand in hand with play, is um, when you realize that you're going to repurpose something that you already put in the story, but you didn't know why you put it in in the first place. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, that bag of raisins on the table, I can use it for X, Y, and Z. Yeah, Jennifer Jacobson coined the word glimmer for that. And mm. I, I have taken that and run. Nice. Um, that when you see those glimmers, especially as a reader, when I see the glimmer in a new manuscript that seems to just have all, all this potential energy and then, but isn't there yet on the page, that's where my critique begins. Is that glimmer can be doing more and you can have more fun with that than you're letting it right now. I know you do this too. You come, you use movie analogies and movie making analogies quite a bit. And I love the idea of thinking, I mean, I think like an actor when I'm doing character, I think like a director when I'm doing plot. Um, but I also think like a producer, you know, yeah. if, if we introduce the candy shop in, in chapter one, can we reuse the candy shop by the end of the story in a new way? Or does, you know, Mrs. Abrams and uh, Mr. Clark, do they, do we really need to hire two actors? Can that be one character? Right, right. keep your budget. Yes. <laughs> 
efficiencies, resonances. Right. All well, of it. It's also, those are, those are some of the ways I think about the power of three. If I have a good setting, I want to use it three times. Mm. If I have a character right. who has a name, I want them to be in three pivotal scenes. Otherwise, like three, three is not just for a sentence or for, for, you know, it has, there are multiple ways of seeing that power of three that I think about as producer director. I love that. Yeah. I've, 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 I'm going to mention her again because I've never agreed more or loved hearing more from an author than Linda Sue Park when on the topic of revision. And mm -hmm. she's crazy. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. But I think she has said she, no noun appears only once in any of her books, for instance. She goes through at oh. that level. Do you ever do the Wordle? Uh, I have done it. Creating the word cloud, is that what that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah. always surprises me to see which words show up in gigantic letters. And um, sometimes they're words that just need to be deleted, like just yeah. or shrugged. But, um, but other times they surprise me and, they say, and I look and I say, that's a theme or that's what I was trying to say. How about that? It's right there in the text. Oh, actually, can I do a quick screen share that brings something yeah. up for me? Yeah. Um, and I've got on the 23rd, I'm doing a free webinar with, through highlights on what I call visual outlining, which sort of ties into everything we're talking about now. And um, let me just pull this up. Um, if I can't find it. Uh, used for uh, visual outlining. Uh, let me get this stuff out of the way. Sorry. Oh, look at that. This is um, this is from Scapel Software. They're the same people who make Scrivener, and um, just what you said made me think of it. There in the middle, I have my main character Rafe Cachadorian from the middle school. This is one of the middle school books I did with Jim Patterson. Um, and I work from Jim's outline, but then I'll take it and I'll adapt it sometimes into a, a visual diagram like this one. And that picture of the football, that picture of the Picasso painting and the one that says, that sort of bursts with the word special, those represent the three uh, subplots, the three threads of the novel that, uh -huh. um, that I found in the outline I got from Jim that I was supposed to start drafting. And it wasn't until I took it out of the, the word into this visual format that I really saw the structure of the book. It doesn't happen that way every time, but it's sort of a, an argument for, you know, using play and revisioning your stories, even at the outlining phase um, along the way, just, you know, sort of finding your way in one way or another. Those other bubbles represent characters and, and uh, pull quotes that I had. And um, on the right there, the, the, the book involved a lot of um, fine art, the character admires fine artists. So that's sort of a little inspiration board. And I just play with the software all the time. There's nothing I use more flexibly than uh, Scapple software. This is a, um, uh, just a map of a journey that my characters took in my Stranded series. That's also Scaffold. Just pulling, there's lots and lots of ways to- It's called Scaffold? With it. uh, Scaffold, S-C-A-P-P-L-E. Um, and I think you can find it at literatureandlatte.com where you also find Scrivener. Um, and like Scrivener, they offer a very friendly 30-day um, trial where um, you only accrue time in that trial on the days that you actually use the software. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's great. It's true for Scrivener as well. Now, I, I mean, your, your visual looked a lot like my connectivity chart, which I do on a piece of paper. I'm a big pencil and um, on the paper person. I get nervous with the, um, with the, with the software, but I'm going to try that because I like seeing the, I like seeing the pictures. Um, I do a connectivity chart that helps me with my secondary characters where I put everybody's name on a piece of paper and I write straight lines between the people who have scenes together and then swervy lines through the people who have conflict, either direct or indirect. So the more swirly, the more conflict. I love that. So when it's my book is really working, the connectivity chart is unreadable. It's a mess. It's like swirly everywhere and everyone is, is creating tension with everybody else. And there is all these underlying fears and insecurities of my characters that are like our misbeliefs, like what Lisa Crone talks about, where um, mm -hmm. all the characters have different motives and I know what those motives are. 
Um, sometimes there's a character that is in lots of scenes that has no squiggly line. Either I can cut her back to producer or I have to improv improvise and say, what am I missing here in this story? Yeah, that's what a lot of those visual tools do for me as well. Um, I like them. I've got this. I, I, I also do. You can see those purple and yellow. That's my middle grade novel in progress right now. Um, and you can do all the, everything I just showed on Scapel. You could do with cutting and pasting and drawing. The argument there being get your hands off the keyboard, do something tactile, um, you know, use your brain in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, and again, all of that to me is writing. So when I'm, that's right. and yeah. when I'm discovering, when I'm in that active discovery mode, I am writing. When I am watching, when I'm looking at my phone, or checking Facebook, I am not writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, those are the things. And when I catch myself doing those things, I have to ask myself why. What am I afraid of that I'm not going back, that I'm not staying in my story? Or is it just the end of the day? One of my biggest questions is, I believe in, you know, the need for, um, actually, I'll share one other thing in a second, um, but uh, the need for expansion and contraction, as it were, and for some time to surf on the web or if, go for a walk if that's your thing. The question for me always is, when have I stopped recharging and when am I just procrastinating? Yeah. <laughs> I think that one of the benefits of this pandemic has been that the slower pace of the day has allowed me to get back into the work um, in a more comfortable way. I, yeah, that, that's true for those of us who are lucky to, to have slowed down in this. A lot of people have sped up. Right. Yeah. And I think that not, you know, as much as I really miss doing school visits, really miss doing school visits, but they were beginning to become a big part of my day. And now the big part of my day is devoted to story because frankly, there's, you know, it's that or more Law & Order reruns. Right. <laughs> I actually, my, my low point in all of this so far was last Friday night. Um, one of the, the, the things that happened for me with the, all the cancellations was I was really gearing up for sort of my biggest spring ever in terms of teaching and traveling. And it was very exciting to me. Um, but, you know, oh, well, it, small yeah. potatoes compared to a lot of other people's problems. Um, and then I did find that quiet, creative space. And then over the next three weeks or so, I started committing to things, I'm, I'm, I, which is not to say I'm not happy to be here talking with you right now. I'm doing more teaching online, et cetera, et cetera. And I could just feel the old habits of overcommitting, right. sneaking in. And Friday got me a little depressed because I had come from that quiet, creative space that I didn't even realize I was missing so much until I refound it. Right. When I originally thought, what was life going to be as a writer? I sort of envisioned what I'm living now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Not, not running around and, and being an, an, an author, you know, or a marketer or, you know, thinking about, or does a sticker designer, yeah. uh, which I have become, you know, like Me I too. actually make a very good sticker, but it, but those are not the things that were serving my, serving my creative heart. And those were the things that were all sort of steered by fear and steered by, uh, of, uh, you know, that fear of not being able to keep up with the career part of this job. And now I feel like, and that's all about product. And comparison as well for me. Yeah, yeah. What we are all, the people doing, yada, yada. Right, right. Her swag is so awesome. Yeah. Why can't I have that swag? Can I put it on my Amex? Yeah. <laughs> The answer should be no. And the answer is, is that the story should, I mean, it is that fear of when your story comes out that no one will read it is real, but you can't control it. No, that's right. I mean, my, one of my sound bites is you need two of three things to make it in publishing, talent, luck, and persistence. All three are great, um, but there's only one there that you can control and that's the persistence. That's the button share, et cetera. And I do think that talent is not necessary. I think that if you are flexible as opposed to talented, that um, you can find a story. You don't have to be they, that beautiful words, while beautiful and wonderful if you have them, um, are not necessary. Um, they, you don't need to have them already built in. You can learn talent. You can Absolutely. 
write a book. It um, dovetails with persistence that way. Right, right. Yeah. You just have to hate. Um, you just have to, you have to not worry about those rejections and see them always as connections instead of brick walls. A lot of this also, we haven't touched on this, although we talked about it before today. Um, it, a lot of this really goes hand in hand, I think very well with what a lot of us are dealing with in the pandemic as well, which is a whole lot of, I don't know, and learning to be comfortable with, uh, you know, in the, in the case of writing, not knowing where the story is going or if it's gonna be any good. In the case of our lives, not knowing how long we're gonna be home. Um, and I saw a podcast recently with a guy named Peter Crone, listened, Peter Crone uh, was a guest on a commune podcast. And he talks a lot about living with the neutrality of I don't know, turning it into a neutral statement um, as opposed to a scary one. Yeah. Um, and, and I really, I've thought a lot about how I benefit from that line of thinking in my creative process. And I'm trying to bring that over into my, you know, emotional life as well. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see it as potential energy and opportunity. Yes. I don't know is an op is again, that open door as opposed to um, a shaky floor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> open doors, not shaky floors. I'm sort of like that. There you go. <laughs> Spontaneously. That's pretty good. Let's, um, can we, so we have talked a little bit about, we've, I mean, I feel like I'm always talking about play um, and inspiration. Um, let's talk about a little bit about collaboration and how that works. Um, sure. I'm sure, everybody sort of wants to know what, what, are, what is that like and how does that change your writing process? Yeah, you, um, a second ago, you were talking about, I don't know if you used the word compromise, but um, you know, when you say you don't need talent, um, there are other ways around it. Um, and I would say, you, know, you, said you, can oh, you said you can find that story um, you know, if you're willing to sort of be a little flexible. And I feel like I found a career by being flexible in that way. Um, I, I had a lot of ideas about what I thought a writing career might look like. Um, and then through no design of my own, uh, these co-authoring opportunities fell into my lap. Um, I, had, I did my first YA novel was an arranged marriage between myself and Lisa Papa Dimitriou, um, arranged by Kristen Pettit at, uh, at the time at Razorbill. Um, and I thought, well, I have this background in theater. I have this background in filmmaking. I was a film major in college. Um, you know, that's collaborative storytelling. Why not? Um, I don't always feel like I have the world's biggest ego or attachment around my stories. I really feel as much craftsperson as artist. I think that lends itself to uh, an openness to collaboration. Um, whatever it is, I still, when I began doing, I did that book with Lisa, um, and then I fell in with James Patterson for the middle school series uh, that he and I've been doing for years now. Um, I've always, for a long time thought of it as a bridge to doing solo work. But as it turns out, again, if you, you know, remain open hearted, open minded, I really like it. It has yeah. it's served my purposes in a lot of ways, including the stereotypically, you know, introverted stay at home writer who has a high profile collaborator who goes out and does the selling and the, you know, and the, the right. promotion of the yeah, book. No, it sounds great. It, um, it, I, I just, you know, I want to back up and say, no ego is really what we're all talking about. Mm. That when your ego butts up against a story element, um, you're never going to get past it. Your, our egos need to t always tone it down so that, that yeah. um, and be, you know, a little bit more humble and let in the story ideas especially after feedback, is that when the ego jumps in. Right. My mantra with uh, collaboration is story is king. Yeah. Um, and if the idea is better, if my idea is better, then it's worth fighting for. If their idea is better, then, you know, let's do it and move on. Let's make it a better story. Um, How much time do you spend on the phone, like debating those kinds of elements? It, when as, yeah, it's really dependent on the project. I mean, James Patterson is James Patterson. And so, uh, you know, my, my succinct way of putting it is that I work for Jim. Yeah. Um, and then when I've done previous collaborations, when I did Stranded with Jeff Probst, if anybody doesn't know, he hosts Survivor on TV, about kids on a deserted island. Um, he certainly knows all about storytelling from a filmmaker's perspective, but he had never done a book before. So that was a lot of long conversations, really laying down the characters, the plot, that sort of thing. Um, in both cases, I did most of the first drafting. Um, and then we would, oh. and then he would take it and do, they both take it and would do some rewriting from there. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. It, that's each collaboration has been different and they've all worked well for me. I know a lot of people who have tried co-authoring and it's not, it, it, it just hasn't worked out for them. 
either it's just not a good fit or um, between the two authors or just between the author and the idea of co-authoring. For me, like I said, I love it. I love, I talk about creative compromise, which is inherent there. That's where the lack of ego needs to come in. But I, at the same time, that goes hand in hand with creative synthesis, which is mm -hmm. you know, a form of story that I never would have come up with on my own. Cool. All right, let's do our lightning round. Yay. So make some questions. All right, some of these I already know now but I'm nope. going to ask him anyway. Okay. Pencil, pen, or straight to the keyboard? Straight to the keyboard, unless I'm doing just little like fitzy thoughts. Scrivener or note cards? Scrivener. Note cards! <laughs> um, <laughs> up early in the morning or late into the night? I'm of total mixed bag that way. Mo more and more up early. These days, up early in the morning. Art and fear or big magic? Oh, both. Big magic. Big magic. Here, wait, drink. What did I say? Chocolate cake or apple pie? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you're killing me. Um, apple pie. Hiking or biking? Biking. What's the job you always leave for last in your writing? Um, with my funny books, uh, counterintuitively, the humor is one of the last things to fall into place. The jokes, the, the funniest parts. That's so interesting. Do you read out loud? all the time and the computer yep. reads to me too yeah oh yes the computer is a terrible reader yes and they exactly don't no emotion any of the parts that they think are good but don't feel like reading they read yeah. everything yeah my little my little pro tip there is to put i put my laptop on the passenger seat for a road trip and i start at the beginning of the manuscript and i just listen to the whole thing as i drive that's such a good idea um what is the most frivolous thing you miss the most most frivolous thing I miss the most, the gym. I don't know if that's frivolous. Nah, yeah, um, I, I, like, I'm surprised at how um, virtual yoga is working for me. I never, oh, nice. Yeah, never would have expected that. No mirror, no hot room, just the breath. Yeah. We are learning new things every day. And Let's, you know what? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, kindnesses. I saw a, an elderly woman walking on my road the other day and I ordinarily would have stopped and see if she needed a ride somewhere. We live in this very yeah. small town. Um, and I knew that I couldn't do that. Um, yeah. things like that. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and yet we're seeing the ultimate kindnesses all over the place. There's, there are moments where I feel like, what am I actually doing here? Yeah. Feeling a bit useless. Um, no, thank you for saying that. That's been, I, I, it's amazing to me how people are really wrestling. It's such a, um, a through line in all my conversations because people are wrestling with the stress, but also with the, the kindness as the, the reaching out. The, even social media has sort of refound its purpose for me in terms of connecting with other people. Yeah, yeah, same, same. And I, I like, I, I'm like starving for empathy. Like I mm. do every good story, every, you know, every story about some person who goes out of their way to create things. I'm like, I just, it fills me up now. Nice. Only the good news. All <laughs> right. So um, seeing where people work is interesting. Could we get a glance at your bookshelves? Oh. <laughs> your actually, your office is really clean. I would never show you my office. <laughs> this is my living room. My office, I don't think the internet works in by design. Yeah. And also, it's a, it, you, there's no place to put anything down. Um, I can't turn my computer all the way around. My books are on the other side of it. it. Um, and they're also freshly reorganized, like probably a lot of people, because haven't we all been doing things like that? Yeah, we've been, um, we've been purging. We've been like from every closet, we're going through the basement. It is, um, um, it's been, we're just getting rid of stuff that we don't yeah. need. Suddenly what we don't need and what we want are really, really clear. Yeah, I mean, that actually ties into when I was making notes for today and talking about this whole living with I don't know. Part of the process has been about trying to figure out what, I, what do I not need to know right now yeah. about the future. Yeah, um, so Kathy said, let, let's both answer this. Um, what do you mean by making a calendar for your book? So what I did was um, I actually took out a calendar and wrote down the main plot points um, for what was happening in my story so that I could see, you know, one, which days were I skipping? 
How long were too many things happening on one day? That is, that is a Sarah classic mistake. The first day, thousands of things happen, and then I start skipping, and I have to revise that, or sometimes I don't. Um, that, um, that I want to use the time both logically and I want to see where I'm missing. So in the book I'm working on now, which is an adult novel, um, the old ladies um, go bowling. Bowling day is Monday. So I have three Mondays in my book. And so they have to be there and they can't be there on Thursday unless they um, call an emergency meeting um, and start acting like mean girls, which they might. So <laughs> <laughs> um, is, there, or is there another, how, do you, how would you have told me to do the calendar thing? Um, you know, that's something I might do by hand. I, I definitely have done that myself. Um, yeah. And I, I, I have been taken by surprise by certain copy editors who say he can't be in school today. Today's Saturday. Right. That kind of thing. Right. Um, so it's a very useful thing to do, including what you said about too much happening all at once. Time passage is a hard thing for a lot of writers. Yeah. I mean, really, um, one of the best lessons I ever got was from Barbara O'Connor who makes a list of the first and last lines of every chapter. Mm. She may not do that anymore, but she did when I heard her speak. As a, and I completely rolled with that. And now I look at those transitions, I'm saying, because those are all first and last lines. And where was, I, where was I jumping in between? Where was I not jumping? Where did nothing really happen? Yep. It was the same place. It was really revealing. Um, in, in a, you know, pretty quick way to, you know, half an hour to do. So um, I, I do that all the time. First beat, last beat of the chapter, and then just in one or two words, what happens in the middle of the chapter? Well, that is, I mean, that's something that the storyboard can do too, is that mm -hmm. you can add, once you start storyboarding, you can add lots of things like, you know, in between, in the space between the squares. Yes. You know, <laughs> and notes and arrows so that you know what, what is adding to your tension in your story. Um, can you talk about how you approach storyboarding a YA novel or scene versus a scene? Um, um, do you do it in chapters? Do you do it by scenes? How many squares are we actually talking about for you? Um, yeah, I do storyboarding when I'm, I don't do it for every part of my book. I do it if I'm feeling a little stuck on a scene um, I will usually not storyboard more than, um, I won't, probably not even a chapter, just a scene at a time. I mean, uh, I had, um, again, like, it sure doesn't matter how good you are at art. My character walks in, he sees somebody reading. Oh, sorry to bother you. It's okay, sit down, yada, yada. I, just to sort of get an idea, especially sort of these static moments for me. I mean, action sequences can be great for storyboarding in terms of what you want to show the reader but it can be even more meaningful when there's not a lot happening on camera. Um, so it really just, it, I, I let the needs of the moment, the scene, the beat, or the chapter determine what I'm gonna storyboard. So when I'm storyboarding, sometimes I'll do the whole novel. I'm a scene, a chapter, a, a one scene, one chapter writer in general. Me too. So that is, so I'm using that white space to, to segue between scenes. So the square per scene per chapter really works for me. And um, so sometimes I'll do the whole book, especially if I'm three quarters of the way done and I'm not sure what comes next. I've got I don't know questions. Then I will, I will storyboard a little bit. Sometimes that unlocks the answers. Um, I also use it for scenery, is that I think that the objects in the room can offer me some some information about my character. So once I've gotten sort of the lay of the land, I start looking for things that I can use. Are there candlesticks mm -hmm. that maybe belong to somebody who's dead? Um, is there, you know, what is there in the scene? Is there a picture on the wall or a mirror? Or is, you know, or is there bathroom cluttered? Um, is the kitchen brand new or is it old? Does the water run, you know, run cold? All of those things I start to be able to imagine when I'm acting as director, looking at the scene versus when I'm, you know, um, in the character's head writing on the page. 
there's an efficiency to that. And there, it also ties me back to what we were talking earlier about uh, play and improv, um, which is part of the, the, the net effect of using a lot of improv, uh, including free writing when I'm first drafting, or I'll say as an aside, when I'm in revision, if I know a chapter well enough to start from a blank page and write it from memory, that's a great exercise for me um, to see what, what's really important to my brain. It's, for me, the net effect is learning to trust my instincts. Um, and not that it that means I'm going to get perfect manuscripts every time, but it does up my so-called batting average. Yeah, it also, again, it feels like play. If you are, re uh, let's use that exercise as our exercise today. Okay. So without peaking, I want everyone to try to rewrite their first chapter and write it from memory of what you know is important to your story and write it fast. You can do it by hand or on the computer, we don't care, um, but try to um, cr create the most important elements of your scene from memory. Just, just rewrite it. See what you remember. I, th I think that that, I love doing that. I do too. Yeah. Of course we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know. Um, it, it's awesome. Um, what, somebody, we, who was talking, were you talking about a podcast? Uh, the Commune podcast with Peter Crone. Po Commune podcast with Peter Crone. I'm going to look that up too. Um, that sounded really, really good. Peter Crone was the guest, not the host. Um, what about writing fiction based on the time of COVID-19? Um, how do we think that COVID-19 is going to show up in literature? I think that the whole dystopian literature is a reaction to 9-11. What are we going to see? Interesting write a lot of stranded stories, maybe? Um, good question. I am very curious to see, I mean, this is undeniably a gigantic historic event, so it will show up in art in a big way. And then the question is how, and then how, you know, not just stories of, you know, the days at home during COVID or of the pandemic itself, but uh, the sort of the emotional equivalence that can come from this. What, what do these kinds of experiences mean to people emotionally? Where else have we felt those emotions? How might that make its way into a story of a different kind? That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Nikki, I do not have any note cards nearby because I'm not in my office. Um, basically what I do, I have a notebook, I have a note card per chapter and I draw a little bit on it. I write notes on it, whatever I need to help myself with it, um, with that chapter. Um, I keep a note card per chapter and then periodically rewrite them as I get to know more and more. Um, and then I can post that up on my board. That was really important for the Worst Fairy Godmother series, because the wish list, mm -hmm. because I couldn't remember the characters <laughs> from one book to another, and I had to keep them consistent. So like, I had to remember who was Minerva and who, you know, like, especially the old people, and keep them the same and make sure that their arcs um, were logical across the four books. So important. Um, um, an anonymous attendee is considering writing a picture book biography of a famous living person. Um, would love to do a collaboration with that person. Have you ever, um, do we know any rules for that? You know, I don't. Um, all of my uh, co-authoring has, has been just by coincidence. It's been, um, I mean, yes, by coincidence, but also a product of showing up and showing up and showing up, you know, at various events, meeting various people, working with various editors who then think of you when it's time, when they're like, oh, Jeff Probst got in touch with us about a project. Chris might be interested in this. Um, you know, networking can be uh, a real challenge and a real time suck, but it can be really lead to productive uh, collaborations, uh, at least they have for me. Um, people often ask me, you know, how do I find that work? And again, I say, keep showing up, but more specifically, um, agents sometimes, you know, can be a, a conduit for that, that sort of thing, as can book packagers. Yeah. Yeah, I think make it, let your, let your agent know that you're interested in that, I think is a good way to start. I also think that let, the other night, Barb Rosenstock was talking about um, research. And if you're going to write about somebody or something, and you want even an expert to talk to, that doing your research first sounds so simple but it's so important so that you're you know what questions to ask you're not just asking your collaborator 
to tell you the story. You're that, yeah. you know, you are, um, you already know, so you're ready to offer that. All right. That was awesome. That was fun. I could have, we could keep, I could keep going. That was oh, yeah. Great. The good news is, Chris, you're going to be back with us next Thursday night and dig in deep on the visual outlining. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to be those, there. One of those things you've committed to that you're, you're now going to say, Wait a <laughs> why did I do that? Well, the, I've closed the door behind me anyway now. Oh, and it's fun. Jen Janeri, it's so neat to see you here, too. I was just looking at that line editing course that you've put together for us online. So, Hi, Jen. So wonderful. Hi, Jen. That was great. I had fun. I hope everyone else enjoyed themselves. Nice string in the comments. Lots of great questions. Um, just wonderful energy between the two of you. Thanks so much for sharing. It's the highlight of my week. I'm, sure. I'm motivated now to write. I'm, I'm going to take out my note cards and get to it. Yeah, that was great. Thank I, you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. And if, any, if there are any unanswered questions, I saw some that we didn't get to about collaboration. Uh, go to my website, email me. I'm happy to, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. So hit me up. <laughs> Before we go, is there one book you can recommend, like a mentor text that, you, that you've really been loving lately? Uh, I don't know about a mentor text, but the, the re, my recent love, love, love was The Prince and the Dressmaker. Yeah. People Same. love this book. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, I want to boost the list, the list of things that will not change by uh, Rebecca Stead. Um, I got what was lucky enough to read it as an arc. It's nice. out now. It is gorgeous, beautiful writing, beautiful story. Everyone should read it. It's fantastic. Okay. Sarah, did you reveal the word? Oh, the word was big magic. Oh. <laughs> I figured we would get there eventually. And I, was, I didn't want to make it just play. I thought that we would all be, you know, we'd all have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Thank Have you. Have a nice day. Oh, if you enjoyed it, please think about a donation to the Highlights Foundation and also check out all of our online offerings. We're adding them regularly uh, and we're really excited. Chris was one of the very first ones that Allison was able to work together with Chris and Aaron to really convert that into an online workshop. So we're excited for that to happen. Thank you. See you all in the next session. See you. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.